talking to many of you that you've had your various brushes with the legal business. I refuse to call it a profession because I think it has degenerated far below the level of being called a profession. Sometime a few months ago, I heard David Hinkson on a conference call with some of the methods that he's been using in some legal procedure and asked him to share them with you uh, to decide for yourself whether you want to try them, whether you want to talk with him about them later, about further information or not. That's, of course, uh, in, accord, in accord with our motto all the time, we present them, you pick them. We don't uh, necessarily know exactly everything they're going to say, but we do believe the information is worthy of your perusal and your own decision. So up there in northern Idaho is where he hails from, down this way, had to bounce around uh, airplanes all day long to get here. But we're glad that he's with us. He also has a line of products in the health field, and I'd like for him to mention that briefly as well, and you can talk to him and his secretary at the table as well uh, during the next few days. So. From up there in around the Grangeville, Idaho, welcome David Hinkson with us this morning. Thank you, David. You guys had to get up early to get down here, so congratulations on that. Thank you, Dean, for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. Am I talking loud enough in this thing for everybody? Okay. Um, the last person who gave his lecture talked about the dragons, and I thought that was most intriguing. Um, I'd like to talk today a little bit about who, or maybe prove to some of you people in the audience that we have already been taken over, and it's not something that's going to happen, it's already happened. And we need to help you to where you can see that you have been taken over, and maybe clarify who took you over and why. Um, uh, Dean asked me to talk about the common law today, and that would be the th main theme of what we're going to speak about. Um, I would like to say that a lot of people have made a lot of assumptions over the years. Um, you live your life with lots and lots of assumptions. Uh, most of them are wrong, and we'll talk about some assumptions here. Um, I have some books here that date back most people here, I think, have heard of John Locke. John Locke um, wrote a series of 12 books. I think it's 12 books, 13 books, a um, couple hundred years ago. The founding fathers of this nation um, used the John Locke books when they created this country. Um, John Locke, if you get his books and read them, this one's called The Reasonableness of Christianity. And the one theme that is very interesting in the John Locke commentaries, and I would recommend everybody here get a set of these, okay, um, is that the law called common law was a law that Jesus brought to earth and gave to man. It is, it is the law that God sent down through Jesus. And so common law, if you understand what common law really is, okay, is according to John Locke, the law of God that you're supposed to be living. Now, this is intriguing because many, many years ago, um, after the Christian reli uh, religion got established, the peasants in England were upset because they wanted their common law rights. I'll see if I can speed this up a little bit. They surrounded the castle because, they, you know, Christianity had swept Europe. They surrounded the castle and they threatened to kill the Queen of England and the king of England if they didn't get their common law rights because all men are created equal and they wanted these rights. Well, the queen was outnumbered, surrounded, and she knew she was going to die that day, so she surrendered and she signed the treaty, the Magna Carta, which guaranteed the common law to the people, okay? But the queen's never been beat and she wanted to get back the power 
that she knew that she was entitled to have because of her royal family and her birth. And so they hacked out a one mile square piece of land, put statutory law in this land, and got all the people who lived all over England to admit that they were British and subjects of the mile square. We have treaties that show that the English crown financed both sides of the Revolutionary War and the War of Independence. They created the 10 mile square just like she created the one mile square. It was part of the conspiracy. Abe Lincoln was elected President of the United States. I do not believe he was ever President of the United States of America. The President of the United States was somebody only in charge of 10 miles square. He was never the President of this combined nation. There was two Presidents during this period of time. There was a U.S. President and there was President of the United States of America and there was two White Houses, two First Ladies. And the Civil War was a war against the 10 miles square which fought the rest of the nation. The wrong side won. The reason the wrong side won was it was the Queen of England who came over with her West Indies Trading Corporation and brought the Africans here and you know, sold the slaves to the settlers, making the settlers participate in slavery. I guess he didn't make them, they volunteered. But in common law, the crime for slavery is you become a slave. This is one of the reasons the NAFTA organization has created a complete slave nation out of Mexico. So the penalty for creating a slave nation, us people in this country being the taskmasters of said slave nation, is for us to now become a slave nation at a worse level than ever before. That's what's planned, I believe, for us at this time. Beings that common law was a law of God, when the founding fathers created the so-called Constitution of the United States of America, the people who lived in this 10 mile square area were part of the Republic of Virginia, or also known as the Commonwealth of Virginia. They were upset because they were bringing the statutory law, the law of the ocean, upon the land. And we had just fought a war to get rid of the Queen's law of the ocean, known as statutory law. They went through all this to get rid of this law and now they're bringing it back and they're putting it in our backyards. We don't want to be regulated by statutory law. So they threatened to kill the people that were the founding fathers. They had pitchforks, they had muskets, they were going to really get quite ugly. And so there was a compromise reached and it was called the Seventh Amendment. And the Seventh Amendment was put in the Constitution of the United States of America, guaranteeing that common law would be preserved in all controversies which ever exceed $20. Now, that's an interesting thing. It's right there in plain sight. The Patriots run around saying, I'm not a U.S. citizen. Your 14th Amendment's a conspiracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What happens when you go to court and say, well, I must be a U.S. citizen? I know I'm not. And I say, I'm a U.S. citizen, I evoke the Seventh Amendment because this controversy exceeds $20. Well, they cannot put common law in a statutory courtroom because statutory law is satanic. Some can call it the law of the dragon, that works. Seems how the United States Corporation is the dragon corporation. Now, Adolf Hitler didn't cancel common law, nor did he cancel the United States of America. If you go to the courthouse, every single property, every single deed that is supposedly BLM for a service is all still in the name of the United States of America. When I gave an oath, when I joined the Navy, during the U.S. Navy, by the way, during the uh, Vietnam conflict, it was to honor and uphold the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, domestic and foreign. And Richard Milhouse Nixon got up and said he was going to defend the Constitution of the United States, no of America, against all enemies, domestic and foreign. Was he my president? Absolutely not. Was he the president of Alabama, Georgia, Florida? Absolutely not. So he was a, he was a domestic enemy, a corporate takeover. And I committed treason as I walked out the door to go to boot camp.
Treason whose penalty is death by hanging, death by firing squad. Did they commit a sin by murdering all those young men on the Vietnam War? Absolutely not. Every one of those servicemen was guilty of treason. When you launch a war, you have to make sure you wash your hands like Pilate did before he sentenced Jesus. The young men that landed on the beach at D-Day, what happened? They landed on the beach. There was no resistance, miles on both sides of the machine gun turrets. But we, we unload the men right there in front of the machine guns. They die like dogs. Is it a sin? No, they were guilty. And innocence is no excuse. Ignorance is no excuse. So they get us to participate in crimes so that we can participate in the penalty. And quite personally, I'm tired of the penalty and their wicked crime. So Abe Lincoln shelved the United States of America. He took that government and shelved it. And this is why the president of the United States has to be a native-born American, because a native-born American is automatically a citizen of the United States of America. So he shelved the United States of America, created a corporation called the United States, Inc., which is not even the government of the 10 miles square, because once the Founding Fathers created the Constitution of the United States of America, which created the 10 miles square, they created a government called the District of Columbia Corporation. Is the United States Corporation the District of Columbia Corporation? Absolutely not. So what is this corporation? I can't find where it was ever created. It has no creation on this continent. I believe the Queen of England and the House of Windsor own it. It's my belief. Um, I looked at some papers that Howard Griswold had showing that all of the revised statutes in all the states were copyrighted by the royal family of England. I don't know if you people know that all the laws are copyrighted. It's kind of an interesting scenario. But back to what I was saying. So Abe Lincoln shelved the United States of America, created this corporate U.S., which is a corporation. And you know what? You can't be a citizen of a corporation. That is impossible. There's no such thing as a citizen of a corporation. Corporations don't have anything in them that are alive. They just don't. So they created the 14th Amendment for their corporation. Now, the U.S. Constitution is corporate bylaws of Corporation United States. Where did it come from? They stole the amendments, or borrowed them, is another way of saying it. They borrowed the amendments and the uh, articles from the Constitution of the United States and adopted it as the corporate bylaws of this new phony corporation. Now, they wanted to get you guys to be citizens of the corporation, but since there is a God and common law ties to the creator God, they had to get you dead. So by putting your name in all capital letters in the English language, you are judicially dead. You have no rights. I've done many lawsuits. I've worked in some of the most prestigious law firms in the country. And I can tell you, I looked at these attorneys and I said, why is my name capital D, capital A, capital V, capital I, capital D? Oh, we don't know. We were taught that in law school. Kind of intriguing. When I joined the U.S. Navy, um, my name was capital D, capital, oh, sorry, capital D, small a, small v, small i, small d, normal, capital R, small o, small l, small a, small n, small d, comma, capital H, capital I, capital N, capital K, capital S, capital O, capital N. What the heck for? I asked, why is my last name all capped and the rest not? I, I, I stopped and I'm too stupid. I wanted to know why. Because I was, you know, these people, I watch these World War II movies. They're fighting for the United States. We go to the post office. You know the post office used to be called the Postal Service of the United States of America? They changed the name of it. The U.S. Navy was the Naval Forces of the United States of America. The 10 Mile Square is... Let's talk about citizenship. What is citizenship? Citizenship comes from the word territory. If I'm a citizen of the United States, that means I live in the 10 miles square. If I'm a citizen of the United States of America, according to the, and I've read back Supreme Court rulings that go back to day one, that's a citizen who might live in Alabama. The of America denotes you reside outside of the 10 miles square. <clears throat> so if I go in here and I reverse it, 
a U.S. citizen is not a citizen of the U.S. That's a reverse. They've reversed the whole sentence. So if a U.S. citizen is somebody who lives in the 10 mile square and a citizen of the United States of America is somebody who lives outside the 10 mile square, what's a U.S. citizen? Well, that's somebody who lives in the piece of paper. That's somebody who's got a phony ass corporate contract stapled to his butt. That's who that is. I don't like it. The 14th Amendment's a fraud. It says you won't question the debt. They were picking on the tobacco companies. They got a good lawyer, made some good arguments, showing that the 10 mile square is the only place they had jurisdiction. Now they're backing off on the tobacco. I got a copy of that lawsuit. Went all the way to the Supreme Court and the media never talked about it. You hire a great attorney, they'll make a great argument for you. One of the letters I sent to the IRS one day was, and I'll give the quote here, um, this, you think I owe 20, you think I owe the money, I don't think I do. This controversy therefore exceeded $20. As a fiduciary officer of the court, you've given an oath to honor and uphold the Constitution of the United States. I don't care if it is a phony Constitution. He's an affiant to it. He swore to God to honor and uphold it, and I could sue him for violating his phony contract. The Seventh Amendment's right smack in the middle of the U.S. Constitution, the phony one, the one everybody thinks is their prize and possession here. We have two of every state before a Blinken. We have the state of California, which is a subcorporation of the US corporation, and we have the California Republic. But do you think the dragon, Satanists, would keep the capital in the same place? Every single state moved its capital. The capital of Utah is not Salt Lake City, it's Fillmore. The capital of Den uh, Colorado is not Denver, it's Canyon City. The capital of California is not Sacramento, it's Los Angeles. The capital of Idaho is Lewiston. It's not Boise. So they're so afraid, these Satanists, they're so afraid, they have to have a whole different building, move it to a whole different city. And just to make sure you guys don't put your name correctly, so you might have your judicial common law rights back, they'll ask you to put your last name first on every application, just to make sure you do it correctly. Anyway, back to my IRS letter. <clears throat> As a fiduciary officer, if you move forth today in violation of the Seventh Amendment, this letter is being sent to you to prove with full knowledge and intent you deliberately violated your oath of office pursuant to the Seventh Amendment, creating a deprivation against me. And when you go to court and you sue them, if you want to sue them in common law, that's not allowed. So a guy tried, he sued them pursuant to common law, and the Supreme Court decided it was allowed. But they couldn't call it a common law trial, and they couldn't tell you it was anti-statutory, so they called it a Bivens action. Name it after the guy that did it. Got to keep you guys in total confusion here. Okay? The definition of liberty is the right to do whatever you want if you don't violate somebody else. The definition of the common law is a law that you don't have a crime unless you injure somebody else. Notice the similarity between the word liberty and common law? They're the same. A republic is a country that has common law. If you have a statutory law, you're not a republic, you're a democracy. Now say your pledge of allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Did it say statutory liberty? Statutory liberty is liberty from Satan. But we're going to put up a big statute in your harbor upon the ocean, and we're going to call it the Statute of Liberty. She's really the Colossus of Rhodes, which is the lawmaker of the sun god Ra. And you can all end your prayers in Amen, which happened to be Ra's first name, Amen Ra. You all assume that when you pray to God and say Amen, you're praying to the Creator God. You assume the word Lord carved on your temples means the Creator Lord, not. You assume the United States is the United States of America? Not. You assume them to be your government? They're not. As we walk around claiming to be U.S. citizens? I think the harvest is going to be very close. I personally don't see the difference. If Lincoln shelved the republic and created a phony democracy corporation called the United States and got everybody to admit they're dead to crawl into it, what did Adolf Hitler do? He was elected chancellor of the Republic of Germany. 
Then he shelved the republic after he burnt down the Reichstag. He created a corporate Germany, working with the Queen of England and the House of Windsor, and he started World War II. He shelved the common law. He brought forth statutory law, created a war, lots of death, lots of dying, lots of murder and bloodshed, right? Ugly situation. I don't see the difference between Abe Lincoln and Adolf Hitler. If Adolf Hitler is one of the evil men of the planet, Abe Lincoln had to have been his predecessor. And like I said earlier, if the right side had have won the war, why do all the lands still find themselves in the title of the United States of America? <clears throat> These people have stolen everything, including your birthright. They've stolen your marriages. Who gave the government a right to be a contract party in the marriage between man and wife with a contract of chattel for the children? Who gave them that right? Who gave them the right to marry us, period, with their phony contracts? They don't have the right. In common law, you get married by opening the Bible up. Two witnesses in common law. Do you think the settlers, when they arrived back years ago to settle the West, arrived in Utah and California and looked up the BLM to claim land? The land belongs to God. And any person with the right of liberty has a right to move on any unappropriated land and take it for himself. As long as he violates nobody, he has the right of liberty. He has a right to claim the land in the name of God. So when Nevada joined the Union, the, the Democracy Union, because it joined after Abe Lincoln seized power, the citizens were all asked to vote by statehood a thing called a disclaimer clause where they forever disclaimed all the unappropriated lands. Now, I thought that might be a, a quick claim deed from the people to the U.S. corporate government. It's not. What were the citizens really saying? They were saying, we forever surrender our unappropriated lands to the United States. What they were really saying was, we won't claim anymore because we don't have any rights pursuant to God. We're judicially dead. Because the United States phony corporation Constitution says they can only own 10 miles square. Even their phony constitution says that. They can't take that land. And in one of the old Supreme Court rulings, um, the Supreme Court ruled that anything not ratified or anything even ratified by consent or anything given can't be ratified by consent if it's not approved by the Constitution. That would have been uh, New York versus the United States, 76 Supreme Court ruling. So they do not own the public lands. The people of this room own the public lands, but if I put you people on an island and I say, okay, there's Fred and, Fred and Harry here, and you both have the rights from God to claim this island, you each have half right now, and Harry gives Fred a bowl of soup, and he surrenders his birthright, now it all belongs to Harry or whoever, okay? And the point is, none of the people in this room are citizens. You are fictitious, dead, corporate members with no judicial rights to claim your land, your birthright. They've stolen your, your marriage. They've stolen your car. They've stolen your boat. They've stolen everything. You don't belong here. You're, these people run around saying, I'm going to vote for Helen Chenowitz for U.S. Congress. Oh, why do I give a damn who runs for U.S. Congress? I don't live in the U.S. I've never lived in a 10 miles square. I want absolutely no part of it. Absolutely no part of it. I don't want to participate in the fraud. I don't want to participate in the lies or the, or the creation of any more phony democracies. These young people run around saying, we must have more democracy. That's fraud. That's a lie. And I, I don't want to participate in it. Anyway, I've covered quite a bit real fast here. Um, there's two of everything. Let's cover that some more. I found there's two Supreme Courts. There's the Supreme Court of the United States, fraud, and there's the Supreme, or the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, that's the correct one. The U.S. Supreme Court is the fraudulent one. I found there's two district courts. There's a district court of the United States, and there's the U.S. District Court. There's two of everything, two of you, two of your names. You know, uh, I was attempted. Um, they attempted to sue me, some of the most prestigious law firms in the country, for slander. I informed them, some things I'd said weren't very pleasant. I informed them that they had the wrong person because that wasn't my name. And if they could fix my name, I would answer the lawsuit. And so they ignored me, and they served me again. This time they put my Christian name on the outside of the envelope with my dead name inside the envelope, and I accused them of mail fraud. I gave them 10 days to respond. 
And then they surrendered. And that was the clerk of court surrendered this time because they were trying to drag me into court. So we beat, we beat the um, one law firm works for the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, and they surrendered on the name. And the next law firm was another prestigious law firm out of Tennessee, and they surrendered. And I just don't want to participate in U.S. lawsuits either. You know, if, if I want to admit I live in the U.S. Uh, territory. And anyway, by the way, the definition of the United States found in the United States Code is somebody who lives in the 10 mile square Guam or Puerto Rico. Now, let's talk about some more fraud. We'll jump around a little bit. The IRS does not exist as a U.S. agency. It's not even part of the phony corporate U.S. It's a separate scam over to the left here. Then we got the separate U.S. scam over here on the right. And yet you people run around and you're being persecuted for not filing your tax returns. And you say, how can the U.S. court get standing to put you in prison or drag you to court? How do they do it? If the, if the IRS is not even a U.S. agency, well, you somewhere in your life signed a piece of paper. Let's call it a W-4. On the W-4, it says, I swear under penalty of perjury to the United States that these facts are true. That's why they want one signed every year, a new 1040 and a new W-4, because your declaration of your W-4 is ongoing until you file the next one. Now, you've already sworn to the court. You think you're going to show up at the trial and say, I don't want to participate? I mean, if I put you on the witness stand and say, do you promise to tell the whole truth, so help you God, and you swear in, and you, I do, do you think you're going to step down now and say, I don't want no part of this? So you've already swore in to their phony court, and you stand there saying, I'm not a citizen, and this, this isn't me, and blah, 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 and the judge looks at you and says, shut up. You mentioned Jesus, God, or the Constitution again, you're in contempt. Why? Because IRS filed a motion of limine, which eliminates stops you from mentioning any common law argument because your name's fiction. And you walked into the courtroom and there's a fringe on the flag and that's not a maritime flag, all the patriot mythology. It's right there. They'll tell you what it is. Just ask Satan what it is. Title four, subsection three or four states, anything added to or subtracted from the flag of the United States of America makes it not a flag. It's a nothing flag. It's the great nothing. So your name's nothing, you're fictitiously dead, you've walked into a court that has no venue. It's a nothing flag. And you're a contract number, you've got a contract, and the whole argument's contractual, so that's why the IRS files a motion of a limney to eliminate your common law rights. You get up and say, I have rights. You don't have any rights. You've got none. You're judicially dead. Now. Years ago, I was a doorman to TROP. I've never been a big tax protester at all. In fact, I was never a troublemaker. But I was studying law and working for a law firm out of Vegas. Um, and I had some ideas and some concepts, and I wanted to try them out. And so I took my W-4. I was a doorman at the Tropicana Hotel. And I wrote above my signature on the W-4, forced to sign as a condition of employment. Was that my signature anymore? No. If I point a gun at you and make you sign your name for the deed to your house, is it your signature? No, sir. It's not your signature unless it's a free will. Where does that concept come from? Common law. Now, if it's not your signature, guess what I put under, under penalty of perjury for the United States? I crossed it off and wrote against my Christian religion. Then across the face of this slimy thing, I wrote exempt, E-X-E-M-P-T. And the girl behind the counter says, you can't do this. I said, how I fill out my satanic forms is my business. <laughs> she says, well, I guess we'll accept it, but let me talk to my supervisor. She brings out her supervisor, and pretty soon she's upset. Well, I got my way. I said, it's not your fight. I want to fight Internal Revenue Service. And I knew I only owed them 100 for the year, and I just wanted to see what would happen. Well, three months later, I got a letter. I was frightened. It came certified mail. And by the way, certified mail is U.S. mail. Registered mail is U.S. of A. There's two of everything. You just have to start looking. I opened up my certified letter. My name was in all capital letters, which I didn't know that wasn't me at the time, but I was happy to read somebody else's mail. <laughs> and it said... And by the way, the letter came from the questionable W-4 reporting officer in Detroit, Michigan. 
He was an attorney. Attorney, by the way, means to atone from common law to statutory law. Somebody who leaves you in the common law is called a counselor in law. A counselor at law moves you to atonement again. Okay. Anyway, the letter stated very plainly that David Roland Hinkson was now exempt from paying federal income taxes. And I was pretty proud of that letter. It wasn't that I wanted to not pay or pay. I just couldn't believe that IRS would send me such a fine presentment. And I went up and down the front door of the Tropicana parading this lovely letter to all the door people because the IRS had just showed up and told everybody they had to report their tips. <laughs> Nobody had the courage. I figured, what could they do to me? It's, I owe them 100 bucks. Even if it was a 500% penalty, I could still afford it. I just wanted to see if these concepts worked. And they do work. Many times you'll get in front of a judge and he will test you to see if you know what you're talking about. And if you don't, he'll, he'll just go right over the top of you. Um, I could tell you some of the victories. Um, I did a, a brief which proved that the BLM did not own the public lands, period. Didn't own a thing. A miner had $40,000 worth of rental fees to pay. I said that pursuant to the equal footing doctrine, all states enter the union equally. Texas never gave up any of their unappropriated lands. So if Texas never gave up her unappropriated lands, um, how could this guy in Colorado, how could Colorado surrender 80% of her lands? Doesn't that violate equal footing? Dang right. Then I said, well, all the people signed the disclaimer clause, but pursuant to um, the Supreme Court rulings that you can't surrender something even with consent. In other words, even when something is given that's not authorized by the Constitution, it can't be ratified with consent of the state officials. That was found in the New York versus United States case. I quoted that. And so the man kept all his mining claims, never paid his $40,000, and to this day he still has the claims. Now, you have the right, if you're a citizen of the United States of America, to claim unappropriated land. So I claimed a million dollar piece right next to a casino. <laughs> Boulder Highway, Las Vegas. We still have it. What we did was we took the guy's mining claim. He had been red tagged on Monday. They gave him till Friday to vacate. And the BLM told him, we're going to clean off your property with semi-trucks and wreckers. We're going to bring out loaders and forklifts, and you're out of here. He didn't want to go. So we had a, a deed, a quick claim deed, and we sold the property from his dead name in all capital letters as he claimed it as a U.S. citizen to his real name in upper and lower case with a comma or semicolon between the middle and last name. And it said that for consideration of $21 that he is selling his rights to the new claimant who claims the land pursuant to his birthright of God, pursuant to the common law. And if anybody has a problem with this new title or ownership, we demand a Seventh Amendment trial that was put right on the face of this contract. Well, the minute you record the document, you give it back to the phony United States Corporation. All you people do not own your own homes. That's why they put the transfer stamp on your deeds. They charge you a transfer stamp when they sell you the property. And they take a photocopy of the original before they send it back to you, showing their corporate seal on your deed, and the fact that you got a receipt showing that you paid your transfer fee, transferring the legal ownership to them. But you're all equitable owners. And just to make sure that you don't own your property, they put the first four words in every paragraph in all capital letters to make sure that you don't really have a title. And they drop the word absolute from your legal description. And to make sure you stay in statutory satanic venue, they give you a statutory title like tenant in common. They know what they're doing. Your property is all pledged to the IMF. And that's where all the IRS money goes, to the IMF. And some of you people actually go watch Mission Impossible and think it's a great story. They work for the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Of course, they fund all the abortion clinics all over the world. I got some stories I could tell that just go on and on. Let's talk about some more fraud. All the laws passed since Abe Lincoln are not laws. The United States Code will spell it out for you. All you got to do is look. Open the front cover of the United States Code. You know what it says? It'll list all the laws. Now, the ones that go before Abe Lincoln that the bankers liked, they brought forward. And they call those positive laws. And under the index page, there's little asterisks right there in front of some of the laws. And if you look down below, it says positive law. 
Positive law is the only law that's been passed. The rest of that law is not positive. There is no U.S. Congress. The only position that's positive law is the creation of the U.S. President, the president who's in charge of the 10 miles square. You see how ugly this is getting? There is no conspiracy. It's right there in plain view for those who can see. The Bible says those that have eyes will see. Those that have ears will hear. But everybody walks around with their blinders on, okay? If that makes any sense. Um, I've covered some of this already. The 14th Amendment, when you look at the U.S. Constitution and compare it to the Constitution of the United States of America, the of America Constitution has no 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, none of that. And you have to ask questions like, if it took a, uh, if it took a, uh, oh, what do you call it, uh, on the Constitution, amendment, an amendment of the Constitution to outlaw alcohol, and an amendment of the Constitution to reinstate alcohol, how'd they cancel marijuana? See, the problem is when you say you're a U.S. citizen, you belong to the piece of paper, not to a territory, not to, you see, and when we're born, we're all born with our common law rights. So therefore, the citizens of Nevada who surrender their common law rights, okay, by voting for this democracy, the first woman that got pregnant at spring break, you know, they were down there in Daytona Beach. She's pregnant. She has a baby. Guess what? The baby has its common law rights again. And that's why we have two court systems. We have the, the juvenile court and we have the statutory big court for the big people who have surrendered. Now, we have to have two of everything, don't we? So they don't want you people to have your rights. Now, in common law, the age of contract is age 14, not 18. That's why when you rape somebody and you're a U.S. citizen, it's called statutory rape. You rape pursuant to statute. The law of legal age is 14, not 18. So you're all 16 and your contracts don't mean a thing because, gosh, you're just not old enough to vote or old enough to do anything yet, are you? So what'd you guys do? You went down and got your driver's license and you thought you weren't old enough to contract, but they're going to let you come down and enter a contract and they put your name in all capital letters right there on that picture thing, put your picture which is you, and you sign that that is you under your all capitalized name. You take your social security number, which is the number assigned to the fictitious name, and you're styling. It's a mark of the beast all the way. It's you. And you go to your high school graduation, you wear your Masonic robes, put on your little black caps, and then you get your degrees. And it just sort of escalates from there. It gets more unpleasant as you go. And you stand up and say, I got rights. No, you don't have any rights. You don't even have a birthright, let alone rights. They've stolen your God. Most of the religions are phony. They're set, they're set up to, to take away. And the minute you go vote and register to vote, you're admitting you're a U.S. citizen. You're admitting you don't live here. So they make sure you get your driver's license. They take your birthright. Now you're going down the rivers of tar, and you see this... Highway Patrol, which is an illegal standing army. It's a cruiser, but you're not really alive, so they're not really violating the law. And they pull you over and they say, can I see your registration and your driver's license? <clears throat> well, you get out your driver's license and what do you say? You say, well, here. And the officer says, is this you? He's taught to say that, you see, because the name is fictitious. It's your picture? Oh, of course that's me, aren't you blind? That's a good day. I, I took a good picture that day. But he's taught to ask that. And then you go to court and the judge goes to a secret judge school where he takes silent judicial notice that we're in bankruptcy. The U.S. is a bankrupt corporation. And you people, if you were even legitimate, you would be stockholders, not citizens. Only, you can only own stock in a corporation. But if anybody here wants to buy my U.S. stock, <clears throat> it's for sale for $21. I'm really glad to sell it to you. You can have my birthright. Anything associated with the United States, I will surrender to anybody that wants it. Because I'm a citizen of the United States of America. And Bill Clinton's not my president. And that Congress is not my Congress. I think one of my, one of my favorite Supreme Court rulings, even for the US Supreme Court, which is a, one just for the phony people here, was Schechter. Roosevelt came out with his New Deal 
and it was pretty ugly, and he was going for the, you know, going for everything at the time. And the Supreme Court of the United States said that the only power that the government had was commerce. And if commerce starts when an object is shipped, and it ends when it arrives, and therefore the 10 mile square has no jurisdiction once an object gets there. Wow. Then there was another Supreme Court ruling called the Four Cans of Yogurt case, where the new FDA, because just created it by Roosevelt, seized a bunch of adulterated yogurt. And you know, they asked for a Seventh Amendment trial, and the government was upset, and the Supreme Court ruled that they couldn't regulate the yogurt because it was worth more than $21. And now we stand around. We stand around with this situation. What's going on here? I mean, we're here, and the government's saying, we have the power of treaty. This is our big secret. Oh, that duck landed in the pond over here. Oh, it crossed the state line. Oh, this gentleman down here had his gutter with water in it, and it flowed across the yard, and it flowed to the next river, and to the next river, and it flowed to another river, and it flowed to another river. And they draw these maps up, the Department of Interior, showing where all the tributaries go. And my gosh, your gutter crossed the state line. Yes, it did. And we're going to call it a wetlands, and we're going to arrest you for cleaning out your own gutter. We're going to make sure we resell you all your property, because you're a gutter person. And so one of the briefs I did against the so-called government was I said, because the guy was going to prison, and I saved him. He was in Utah. And I said, Salt Lake's in the middle of the state. Never crossed a state line. The water flowed out of this gutter, went to this gutter, went to this gutter, flowed through this river, and ended up in the Great Salt Lake, and it never crossed a state line. Therefore, you don't have any interstate commerce. You have no jurisdiction. Well, that upset them. So. Here's the point. Nobody has ever argued the Seventh Amendment against the Commerce Clause. Maybe I want to ship a load of machine guns across the border. Maybe it's outlawed machine guns, but they're worth more than $21. The Commerce Clause never gave them power to regulate anything. It gave them the power to charge a little bit of tax on about three items, alcohol, tobaccos, tobacco and guns. They can charge a tax. But the Constitution never said they could regulate it. The power of commerce was there for one reason and one reason only, to make sure that nobody stops commerce. It was a guarantee to make sure that commerce was free flowing from point A to point B. So if a federal agent comes to your door and says, you have violated FDA rules, I want a Seventh Amendment trial. It doesn't matter if I'm a U.S. citizen or a U.S. of A citizen. It doesn't matter if my name is dead and I'm judicially dead. If I evoke the Seventh Amendment, Jesus ascends into the courtroom. Now they've got to deal with God. There was a patriot who was in court, and they'd taken his children, and they had made sex slaves, CIA sex slaves, this kind of thing. And his wife had died in prison. His crime was homeschooling. And the judge looked down at him and said, do you have anything to say before further sentencing? He was going back to prison. He said, well, I would never violate the Creator God or take his free agency away, but if it be his will for your crimes against liberty and the God of creation, I ask that he smite you, that you and your family all be dead before one year from today, and the prosecuting attorney. And they all were. Because the only real sin is liberty. If there was a God who gave liberty and common laws his, could Babylon be nuked? for having inequities? No. These guys, you, these guys all have a right to go suck on satanic whatever. They, they have the right. But when you violate somebody else's liberty, that's when God can come nuke you. And that's why you have to volunteer your signature on the IRS forms. Everything is by volunteer. They want you to volunteer. You have to volunteer. You have to take the mark of the beast as a voluntary thing. If I point a gun at one of you and say, sign your name, it's not your signature, that's not the mark of the beast. See, you got to volunteer so that they don't get nuked. They're afraid. They won't put your name. Churches that are 501c corporate churches have to put your name on their church records in all capital letters. They cannot put your name in upper and lower case. I offered the Mormon Church $10,000 to 
to put my name Christian on my paperwork because I was born and raised supposedly a Mormon. For $10,000, they won't put my name on there. I offered them $50,000 two years ago. All they had to do was put my name correctly on the church record, and I'd admit to be a Mormon. But I told them that's not my name. That's not me. I wasn't baptized. For $50,000, oh, it shouldn't be a problem. Oh, that doesn't matter. But when they became a 501c corporation, they changed their name from the Church of Jesus Christ. They changed their name to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And every one of these churches that became a 501c changed its name as it incorporated. I'm not trying to pick on them, but let's talk about surveying for a minute. There's two kinds of surveys. Got two of everything else, right? An oceanic survey of statutory law. What's it called? Basin Meridian? What do you call a survey of common law? Well, it's called longitude and latitude. So we go into the west, and we bring in the U.S. Coast Guard, and we resurvey all of Utah and Colorado and Arizona underwater with a basin meridian survey. And then we find the highest mountain peak in every meridian, and we call it the number one high water mark brass cap for that meridian. And then we re describe all of your property pursuant to the high water mark, which means it's underwater. As a good Mormon, I was taught that Satan controlled the ocean, and that's why the Mormon missionaries took plane trips and not boats. Well, if Satan controls the water, why'd you resurvey all of Utah underwater? <laughs> now, the symbol of Babylon was the eagle. Everybody heard that earlier. Well, the symbol for Satan is the, he's a god L. Lucifer, okay? The L is the God of light. He's the Illuminati. You put the L in front of the word eagle of Babylon, you got the word legal. And you describe your property, it's the legal description. So a legal description is a piece of property described pursuant to the boundary of underwater statutory law, satanic law. And they own it. And people here say, well, gosh, how come the IRS came in here and seized my house? You don't own your house. If the United States Corporation owns the state of California, and the state of California owns the recorder's office, and they got their corporate deed, and you gave them a transfer stamp, of course they can use a notice of lien to take what's yours. You got no right to it anyway. You're just a renter. In fact, we'll evict you on the courthouse steps. We don't even have to have a trial. You're dead. But none of this matters. I challenge anybody here to get any government agency to put your name in correct appellation. The United States Styles Manual, section 33.3, .3, which is where the Masonic thing is for the kidnapped the children and murder and rape and all that. I mean, 3.33, okay? But that, under 3.33, in the U.S. Styles Manual, it tells you how everything has to be put in the United States. And it says that an all capitalized name is a vivid personification. And if you look up vivid personification, it's an inanimate object like a rock named Harry. You people are inanimate. So you do your brief to go to court. Let's talk about some more fraud. The United States of America indicts you. Mm -hmm. Do you know that the United States of America was authorized to do a grand jury? Only republics can do grand juries, indictments. So you get your indictment. It says, greetings. The United States of America indicts you for the following crimes. And the word indictment is capital I, space with an underline, capital N, space with an underline, capital D, and the next thing's a space with an underline. There's no underline under the letters. It's in all capital letters spaced out to make it not the word indictment. Got to make sure we don't violate our creator God here. So we got the word indictment not really saying indictment. We have U.S. of A up there, all capitalized. And then down below, we change to United States where they actually charge you with the crime that says the United States this, the United States that. Well, goodness gracious, if I get arrested in Germany and I'm going to be tried in Germany and they sneak me to France in the dead of night, that's fraudulent conversion, a violation of international law. Every person in prison has been put and sentenced and charged wrongfully pursuant to this fraud. In common law, there's no prisons. That's why in Saudi Arabia, they have the death penalty. People would rather die than go to prison. They don't want prisons. In common law, if you rape, 
Whack. If you steal, whack. They'll cut off a body part, but they give you a choice. You can have 100 lashes, 100 floggings, get your head put in the stockade out there in the sun, get roasted. But I mean, there are no prisons in the common law. How much time do we have left? A minute and a quarter. Uh, does anybody have any questions for the last minute? The executive orders, the first one created was by Abe Lincoln. Are the, are they're not legitimate. In what way? Well, they're not legitimate because they're not positive law. So they can all be canceled? They only affect people who live in the 10 mile square. Or better way of saying it is they only affect people that are tied to their contract. You don't have to denounce your social security number. You never had one. That's not your name in all capital letters. Patriots run around saying, I'm going to denounce it. I never had one. Now, my dead name did, capital D, capital A, capital V, capital I. It was a signed one. Okay. My next question is, uh, the United Nations have been signing all these uh, treaties with these... The United Nations treaties. Okay, the national parks. The people own the land. The problem is there's no people left. You all live here, but you're not here. You're on the island, but you said that I'm a, I'm a citizen of this piece of paper. So the Queen of England and the other people keep the common law for themselves. That's why the BLM is a Bureau of Land Management. They're managing the land because there's no citizens. And since there's nobody there, if you go to the BLM, they'll give you permission to trespass out there because you're there. They're not regulating the land. They're regulating you. You're their property. And if you move to France, you're still going to pay. You're paying because you're the one being regulated. Does that make sense? I have a Ignorance. feeling uh, you have a few more questions, right? Yes. Well, you can see him later. He has a workshop. <laughs> has he given you a little something you didn't hear before? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>